career started at a very, very early age when my mom used to take me to the World Theater when my grandfather was an actor who played Santa Claus for the neighborhood. And Hot Rod, this jockey, would have Christmas shows there. And I got really interested in the music that I heard, the R&B music, back in the 50s and 60s. And what I did, you know, as a normal kid in the neighborhood, sports was my first situation. I wanted to be a baseball player at the time. But when I found and listened to groups like Frankie Lyman and the Teenagers, and the girls were coming after the guys, I flipped out and wanted to become a singer. And I met a guy, a disc jockey, at a radio station here in Baltimore, WSID. His name was Bill Sparky Mullen, and he took an interest in me, and every Saturday, he would have different entertainers locally to come down and put them on the radio, and I used to hang with him and did record hops, and one day, we decided to record a song that a friend of mine, David Robertson, and I wrote called Tears in My Eyes. That was the first beginning, but I, I was with a doo-wop group at Dunbar High School called the Del Rio. And we did a little demo at Morgan, I'll never forget that. But it, 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 nothing ever came of it. So Sparky came up with the idea of releasing Tears in My Eyes. And that's where it started growing and I started singing with bands and, and, and going on shows. And uh, the funniest thing about it, growing up in Lafayette Projects, there was a lot of talent around there. And all the guys had groups. You either was in a gang or a group or you play sports. So I chose to play a little sports, but I chose to be in. to take you really on a little journey. I've been blessed to work with people like James Brown, Jackie Wilson, Otis Redding, Temptations. I was fortunate enough to work at a nightclub called the Blackjack Club in Baltimore where six days a week, each week, there was a different act. The Contours with Dennis Edwards came through. Tammy Terrell, Brooks O'Dell, Chuck Jackson, Laverne Baker, uh, Billy Stewart, and the list goes on. And I was fortunate enough to open up the show with a group, a house band called the Hitchhikers. And how that came about, there was a friend, God bless his soul, that called me up one day and said, Kenny, they have an interview, audition and interviews for singers to replace the lead singer for the group called the Hitchhikers, which was gonna become a house band to back up all these acts. And these guys were top musicians who could read. And the guy that got me the opportunity, God bless his soul, his name Warren Garrison, he has since passed. And that was a great experience to play with the group. I got, I got hard out of many, many singers. And that was a great experience. I've been blessed to go all over the world, Japan, Australia, and the UK. And uh, it's been a great experience to do this. But you know, growing up in the Lothia projects was a was a learning point with my siblings. It was five of us. I'm I'm the oldest of five. And I really wanted to, 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 to leave out of Baltimore and see where I could spread my wings. You know what I'm saying? If you think you're good enough, you should be able to go anywhere and be received. 
but I was blessed to go a lot of places and to do a lot of things. And along the way, there's a lot of people that are responsible for helping me. One was, as I said earlier, Bill Sparky Mellon, and also a, a disc jacket called Fat Daddy that was on WSID and WWIN. He, in return, got me on a show in Annapolis, Maryland, at a high school. And there was a young lady on the show It was with a record company called Rojack. Not, not to be confused with Rojack, which was a label in Baltimore. But Rojack was a label that was distributed by Atlantic Records in New York. And he was instrumental in me getting with this company. And the first song I recorded for the company was produced by Burke Burns. And the song was called Show Me Your Monkey. That was a novelty song, and if you ask me today, like most people have, what it meant, well, it was a dance. A lot of people interpreted it a different kind of way, but it was a dance called The Monkey. When The Monkey Time was out, that Curtis Mayfield wrote and produced for uh, Major Lance. So we took on this characteristic of doing this song called uh, the, Show Me Your Monkey, and it was recorded at Atlantic Studios in New York by, and the producer and writer was Burt Burns. Well, Fat Daddy was instrumental in getting me this. Only recorded one song for the company, and as it were, the company dispersed. I came, you know, running around trying to get a record deal. Well, Behold Again was Fat Daddy. Paul Johnson. He said, look, I have a friend up in, in, in Philadelphia that has Arctic Records. He's a disc jockey named Jimmy Bishop in Philadelphia on radio station WDAS. Got me uh, a ticket. I went up to Philadelphia uh, and met Jimmy Bishop. And in return, Jimmy introduced me to an up-and-coming young songwriter named Kenny Gamble had wrote a song called Anything You Want. If you were hungry, I'll give you the last word 
recorded that along with a remake of Looking for Love by Bobby Womack and also a remake of Hey Girl by Freddie Scott.
I did about maybe 10 songs for uh, Arctic Records, and I became part of the earlier Philadelphia sound. And along with Winfield Parker and myself out of Baltimore, and another young lady named Nella Dobbs out of uh, Havity Grace, Maryland, she was also part of the Philadelphia sound, but Jimmy Bishop had put her with the Warren Records that was Maxine Brown, Chuck Jackson that was on. So that evolved of me uh, getting the opportunity to meet people like the Intruders, Teddy Pendergrass, Harold Melvin's Blue Notes, and Barbara Mason. And we were, uh, I, you know, I was in the mix and, 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 and got with some top musicians like Ronnie Baker was the bass player, Earl Young, drummer, who ended up being the leader of a group called The Tramps, and also was with a group on Arctic Records called The Volcanoes. Also on Arctic Records was Barbara Mason, who was the main big star, a group called Ambassadors, myself, Winfield Parker, and I was real close to a guitar player that did all the sessions in Philly, they, uh, Norman Harris. So I got, I was blessed, I've been blessed to get with a lot of musicians. In my career, it, 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 I've been in this business for 60 years, and there's nothing else I would rather do. I mean, when you can, you know, enjoy a job that you can have fun at and enjoy. And listen, keep in mind, I got a chance to travel all over the world and be paid for it. You know, like I said earlier, I mean, I have a big name over in England uh, and in the UK. And uh, these days I'm still recording. I'm living in Connecticut now. I've been up here for about 40 some years. Been married to my lovely wife for 38 years. And we have uh, six children. Now I have about 12 grandchildren and five great grands. Uh, I went to Dunbar High School, and uh, that was a great institution for Dunbar High School because if you know anything about sports, some of our best NBA ball players came from Dunbar, you know. So I had, I, I really felt that I went to a, a fantastic high school. Uh, my only regret that I didn't finish high school, but I got my education on the road. And I always say I got my education. I went to the University of Life. So, I mean, I have a degree in that. But uh, I've been blessed to do a lot of things. And I like to thank my uh, producers, Carl Lamont Bellamy, and also my nephew, DJ Feller, who's Darrell Brown, my baby sister's child. What's up, everybody? I just wanted to take time out to speak about my uncle, Kenny Amber. Great man, great man of God. A man who did what he wanted to do, which was do music for all of his life. Um, I never known him to have a regular job. I just known him being on the road a lot, doing tours, uh, being overseas a lot in London different places all over the world. Um, I remember being seven years old holding in his album cover. It was called Kenny Hamber and the Hitchhikers. Uh, little did I know, 40 years later, I would be his producer, producing uh, two gospel albums, and now we're doing house music. So, very proud of my Uncle Kenny. Wow. Um, Uncle Kenny, you know, He's literally a, a living legend, an icon. Sometimes people hear a name, but for me personally, I really didn't realize how much of a catalog that he had, you know, and how much of an impact that he really was for the, you know, beginning sound of what they call the Philadelphia soul, you know, and it's... I'm still in awe at the stuff that he's doing and the fact that he's in his late 70s and he's still doing it, you know. It's, I, I can't even conceive 
you know, what that's got to be like. You know, I mean, we see it on TV, you hear about it, but to actually see a, you know, living legend and icon in the music industry, you know, who still does it for the love of the music. And, you know, it, it, it's inspiring. It really is, man. And by me living in Connecticut, I end up starting the group. Well, I left the group, the Hitchhikers in Baltimore, and end up going up to Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, how that came about, uh, 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 a promoter and agent named Jimmy Thomas had a, had a Thomas theatrical agency in Philadelphia. And how I met him, I was at the recording studio with Jimmy Bishop, and he came down to bring some contracts. So Jimmy Bishop was managing a group called Honey and the Bees, which did a lot of background work for me when I was with Arctic Records at the time. So this story involves me getting into Providence, Rhode Island, which I spent over 30 years there. And we first went to Providence and worked a club called the Osborne Club, which was owned by Jeffrey Osborne's mother. And I got a chance to see Jeffrey Osborne make it before he went with the LTV. Before he, actually when he left Providence to go out to California to join the group, what he did until the group got together, he was Jerry Butler's, and Smokey Robinson's drummer. Most people don't know that. So I had a chance to uh, work in Rhode Island in another group out of Rhode Island in New Bedford, Mass, called Tavares. 
So I was blessed to be with him, to know Tavares and know uh, Jeffrey Osborne because I ended up playing at his mother's nightclub called the Osborne Club. So I lived in Rhode Island for, like I said, over 20 some years and uh, met my second wife who I'm now married to now. Uh, and I ended up moving to Hartford, Connecticut, which I'm still in Connecticut, love Connecticut. It's good to come back home, but I love, and some people, aren't you crazy, you love the cold weather? Well, you get used to it, you know? And like I said, I've been blessed. I mean, I have a new album out that, that was helped put together by uh, Carl and DJ Fella. I'm, I'm really happy. And the guys back in Connecticut that my band and rhythm section and background people have been a part of my life. You know, and also my musical background, people say, well, Kenny, who in your family other than your grandfather was talented enough? Well, I had an aunt. Her name is Braley, my mother's sister, who was a fantastic jazz artist. And speaking of my mother, it's ironic that my mother was Billie Holiday. She cleaned Billie Holiday's house in, 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 in Baltimore. And there's an article uh, in the Afro where they talked about my mother with Billie Holiday. They became friends. And uh, I'm most proud of that, you know. And I'm also proud of the fact that Reginald Lewis, the entrepreneur and lawyer who has the Reginald Lewis uh, Foundation in, 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 uh, in Baltimore down by the harbor. That was my cousin. So uh, people, famous people, has been in my family and corner. But uh, my musical background, I have to also say that years ago, my mom, dated a gospel singer, and I had the pleasure of meeting Mahalia Jackson when I was a young guy. Five Blind Boys of Alabama, Sam Cooke, Clara Ward, the Davis sisters. So I, I guess I was prone to, to, to be in this business whether I wanted to or not. It was meant, it was written for it to happen. Uh, I was raised by a fantastic woman by the name of Virginia. And my father was Jamaican. And uh, used to, when I was a kid, used to go back and forth to New York. And we used to live with this family called the Collin, Collins family. And they sort of like adopted me as their family. And she had a son named Rudy Collins who was a fantastic drummer that plays with Dizzy Gillespie, Count Basie, and and, and on and on. So this has been one, one, one hectic experience. Do you remember? You know, uh, and I thank God. I'm a very spiritual person. I believe you can't do anything without Jesus Christ in your life. And I just hope I've been able to share some kindness and a little bit about my life. My life goes on further, but I would have to spend the rest of my life telling you about my life. But as a musician, I enjoy performing and singing, writing and producing. And it's always a great thing when a person can tell you they enjoy their job. And I enjoy mine. I mean, I would never imagine in my lifetime if I wasn't doing what I was doing, would I have been able to afford to go to places like the UK, like Japan, like Australia, and also Southwest Asia over there in, in, in Kuwait, places like that, uh, Bahrain. So being a musician, has really paid off. It's a tough, it's a tough, believe me, it's not as easy. I'm telling you the good purpose, but it's been some hard times. It's been some rip off, dealing with certain people. It's not all glamorous, 
The one thing about this business is that you gotta be passionate about it. And you gotta be able to, to roll with the punches and you also gotta be able to uh, say you're not gonna give up. Because once you give up anything, I don't know, you know, it's hard to come back. I've never had a day job. Uh, I couldn't imagine getting up at five o'clock in the morning and working until five o'clock the next afternoon. But uh, I've been blessed. I'm happy in doing what I'm doing. And at my age, I'm still doing it. I'm over 70 years old. I think I'm better than I was. I've learned a lot. Learned how to pace myself on stage. Learned how to sing in different keys where I'm comfortable. I never, I never was a smoker, I never did drink, so I was blessed in that area. So I took care of my throat and took care of myself. Somebody asked me if I wasn't into show business with what I've done. Well, as I said, I wanted to be, I, I had aspirations of being a ball player. And at one time I visited the Baltimore Orioles camp, met people like Boot Powell, Brooke Robinson, and I hurt my leg. And as I said earlier, when I saw the girls running behind the singers, I went out and got a process and learned how to sing. And the girls were there. Uh, also, when I was living in New England, I think other than playing ball, if I wasn't, in, I would be in music because I was a program director at a radio station. Had a radio show for five years. And I sort of learned that from Fat Daddy and, and, and Bill Mellon. I wanted to be a disc jockey. So I think it's been in my blood to have some music. Uh, now I try to witness or talk or mentor younger acts to let them know that it's just not the glamour. There is a business side of show business. And the business side is, it's been very, very, not fair to a lot of black musicians because Back in the day, they were taught, you do the music, we'll take care. So a lot of, a lot of the people were taking, their, their songs were taken from them, their publishing rights were taken from them. And what I try to do, is, I think I'm a good business person, is to say that you have to, first thing you have to learn when you start making money, is get a good lawyer, a good accountant, and, and, and you have somebody to look over your lawyer and you have somebody to look over your accountant because it's, it's, it's a doggy dog world. And you have to be careful, managers and agents. And most, most people don't understand what a manager is. They think that a manager is supposed to do this and that. Well, they are, but you have to keep in one thing. When you hire a manager, that manager works for you. You don't work for the manager. So you have to sort of Tell the manager how you want your career to go and hopefully she or he can handle that for you. You got agencies you got to deal with. Uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of people that make demos. They don't know how to go about working in the studio, what they do after they do that. I think the route to go right now is very independent because the record business is not is what it used to be. In other words, you could get a contract and you, uh, you know, the record company works for you. But right now, because they're not signing a lot of people, and a lot of people don't know when they do sign with record companies, they owe that record company money because it's a loan. And once they put the record out and put out videos on you, they have to recruit that money. So a lot of times you don't make, unless you're a songwriter, you, can, you know, you don't make any money unless you're touring. And it may be the next five years before you ever see any money from a record company. So that's been part of my life. That's something that I enjoy doing. And I just once again appreciate the talent and the gift that God's given me.
If you only 